So consider this to a companion video, to my, come on guys, you know, time to let go of Corbyn. Sure, keep the policies, but, you know, time to let go of Corbyn. <laughs> you know, it's time to let go. We need to move on. We need to move on and we need to beat the Tories. And I have said this time and time and time again. Labour is the only left party. It is a big tent party because it has to be. Our current, you know, political system, the voting system, does not benefit having multiple left parties. We have to get out next time and vote. Starmer is not perfect. I will agree there are massive problems with, with Keir Starmer and some of the stuff that he has done and said over the past couple of weeks. But I will tell you this now, Corbyn was not perfect either. Because if somehow Corbyn had won in 2019 and we were here in, you know, current date 2023, Corbyn's, you know, the PM, and he was saying the stuff he's been saying about Ukraine at the moment, I'd be calling him for to be removed as leader of the party. Because his stance on Ukraine is absolutely awful. And that's not even including the stuff with the fact that the stuff that he went on to do as leader. Hence why I always say Corbyn was good on domestic policy, but he was awful, awful as a leader of the Labour Party. And here's the thing. I open this up to anyone. Look, Max and Political X do the Good Morning Brunch. And I will open this up to anyone. Go to Max, go to Political X. Heck, if either one of those two wants to have this discussion with me as well, I'm open to this. Let's have a, a Good Morning Brunch where the topic of discussion is the current Labour Party. Someone can be, you know, uh, opposing me, who hates Starmer, whatever. I, I, I really don't care. I will stand in the affirmative that at the moment, the only way to beat the Tories at the next general election is to vote Labour. Like it or not, that is the way we have to go. But I want to talk about something else because I was thinking of doing this article. Uh, again, it's about a month old at this point, but <clears throat> I think, to be honest, it still stands. I didn't get a chance to do it at the time. But I am for it. The guy who wrote this is a economics professor at the University of Sheffield. I agree with him. I agree. You get a lot of people that ignore, for whatever reason, 100% of what other people in the Labour Party are saying. People ignore, for example, what Ed Miliband has been saying about strengthening unions. But for some reason, everyone... Uh, seems to be, but well, most of a lot of people on the left seem to be of the opinion that Starmer is not going to protect workers' rights. But you have certainly under the EU uh, reform bill, Labour put forward the motion and the amendment to protect workers' rights to make sure that those could not be touched. And again, you've got Ed Miliband going forward and saying Labour is not only going to protect workers' rights. We are going to advance the rights of unions as well and give unions more power. People ignore what uh, stuff Angela Rayner says. And of course, stuff we're going to go over today, what Rachel Reeves, who would be the chancellor, has been saying for so, so long. She would be, if she gets in, the most greenest chancellor we have ever had. But yet, According to people, I, I hear, oh, Labour's just Tory light. I'm sorry, but these policies that we're about to go through, the Tory, the Tory party would not even consider touching with a barge pole. So let's go through this. And like I say, that offer is open. We'll go do it on a, on a neutral platform. Like I say, you'll have Max and Yo political X as well to 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 back you up or, or whatever to keep the conversation civil. So I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Um, you know, reach out to them. I'll reach out to them as well, see what they say about having this conversation. I'd be more than happy about having this conversation and up for it. 
let me know what you guys think. Um, but yeah, I am I am very, very happy to defend my position on this. I am very happy to defend my position on this. Uh, it is not a problem for me to defend this. So, as always, guys, uh, before we go diving into this, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page, the one updation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. There's the YouTube thank you button, and of course, the Pony Club down below as well. So, as always, let's go diving over uh, into this. This comes from The Guardian with the title of Kier, a Keir Starmer government might be more radical than you think. So, the bookies will now give you even money on Labour forming a majority government at the next general election. So, what kind of government would Keir Starmer's Labour be? For the first two years of his leadership, this was a difficult question to answer. The party's strategy focused entirely on presenting Starmer as neither Boris Johnson nor Jeremy Corbyn. Politically bare came into a <coughs> and policy barely came into it, except to jettison flagship Corbyn commitments, such as nationalization. So the policy phobic uh, did not Starmer did not appear that way on Radio 4's Dead Ringers as portrayed him as constantly astonished that it was possible to have any opinions at all. The view that no one no one knows what Starmer stands for still appears to be widely held. But in reality, it should not be anymore. Over the past few months, Labour has adopted a host of policy positions, particularly on the economy and are considerably more radical than Starmer's critics might have expected. Not that you would know from his... <coughs> oh, pardon me. Not that you would know from his political demure of the leader of his sh of the leader and his shadow cabinet, Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Both have gone out of their way to emphasise Labour's fiscal discipline. No spending pledges without showing how they will be paid for. A commitment to bring down the national debt, and business leaders have been audaciously wooed. But look at the policies themselves, and this is the important point. The policies, when it comes to our political system, you do not vote for the man in charge, you vote for the policies you want. And unfortunately, in our political system, you are never, ever going to get everything you want. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who seem to think that should be the case. I'm sorry, that's not how politics works. You never, ever get 100% of what you want. And I've said this before. I would rather get a Keir Starmer government that gives me 30 40% of what I want than continue with potentially another Tory government that is going to give me nothing. <coughs> so, so let's look at the policies themselves. And even while not yet wholly defined, they are far from timid. So, take Labour's fiscal stance. Reeves promised to abide by the golden rule, that in normal circumstances, government should borrow only for investment, but that still allows for significant capital spending. Labour has pledged over £28 billion a year for climate action this decade. This is a larger annual figure than promised by Corbyn and John McDowell. And under Ed Miliband's stewardship, Labour pledges to achieve a net zero power system by 2030 and established a new publicly owned energy generation company to drive a, um, <coughs> and to drive a, 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 a 10 year 60 billion pound energy efficiency program to fix Britain's leaky homes and buildings, creating tens of thousands of new jobs and apprenticeship across the country. That's not Tory light. Those policies right now are not Tory light. And I challenge anyone for any of these policies that we go over to say that how these are Tory light. Please do enlighten me. But again, if you want to have this opportunity to challenge me, get in touch with Max, get in touch with Political X. Let's set something up on, you know, the Good Morning Brunch. 
I am determined to have this conversation because it needs to be had because I'm fed up of people just wigging out the second I say, well, I liked Corbyn, you know, his domestic policies, but he wasn't a good leader. And as soon as I say that, it's like I've committed some sort of heresy. But anyway, let's continue. So also aiming, <coughs> pardon me, also aiming at the same time to tackle the UK's abysmal, abysmal productivity rate, considerably lower than that of Germany, France, and the US, and a persistent trade deficit over the last 25 years, made worse by Brexit, Labour has recently published a new industrial strategy. For the first time, this will focus on not just high innovation sectors such as aerospace, but on the everyday economy, such as retail, transport, light manufacturing, services, and seeking to raise productivity, and therefore wages. And in these sectors in which most people work, Labour plans to use one of the very few genuine Brexit freedoms to target government procurement on UK companies. It wants to reduce the UK's import bill and strengthen the reliance on the economy in sectors such as food, health supplies and medicine, which were badly exposed in the pandemic. Reeves has further committed to establish a national wealth fund to take equity shares in Britain's successful new business. Would the Tories ever establish something like that? No, not in a month of Sundays. So let's go on to this as well. Labour will also introduce significant economic devolution to ensure that the benefits of its, of its industrial strategy flow to all parts of the country. Contrary, a uh, uh, commentary on Gordon Brown's recent report on constitutional reform focused mainly on the abolition of the House of Lords. But, and to be honest, we focused on that as well. I think that would be good and something that Labour should absolutely focus on. Uh, but again, we're talking about, obviously, other stuff as well. But again, the Tories would never go near abolishing the House of Lords. But again, here we go. But arguably, Brown's more significant proposals are for local authorities to be given major economic powers and budgets to drive economic development across England, with new powers also devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Starmer has promised to consult on Brown's proposals, but with wide support among Labour Council leaders and mayors, it is hard to see them being rejected. So that is something to look forward to, certainly in the next Labour manifesto. But will Labour's fiscal responsibility inhibit its spending on public services? Perhaps not as much as some fear. Reeves has understandably been reluctant to say she will raise taxes, but she has also made clear her view that unequal tax treatment of the wealth is wrong. This suggests that Labour wants to equalise tax rates paid on capital gains and dividends with those on wages and possibly to charge national insurance on investment income. Reeves has already said that Labour would abolish the nom-dom status. These measures would raise about £26 billion a year, which would go some way to funding the party's commitments to the NHS, social care and childcare, and the social infrastructure on which the economy depends. Again, how, how, how are anything we're discussing here labor light -like proposals uh, not not, not labor light -like, but you know tory like proposals the this is actually pretty radical but the thing is it's not as radical as a lot of people on the left want and as i said before you don't get everything you vote for that is impossible so some of this stuff absolutely people should be for the local economic empowerment that would be amazing that would be absolutely amazing for all these these towns and councils to suddenly go, oh my, we've got all this money we can spend on our, our, our local economy. Well, we know exactly where we're going to spend it. That would be perfect. It would be amazing. Again, 
getting rid of the nom dom status. The Tories would never go near that. They've they've had every chance to do so, but they have not done a thing about it. At the same time, Labour is committed to raising the minimum wage to the level of a proper living wage. Its package of workers' rights and protections includes banning zero-hour contracts and bogus self-employment and ensuring all workers from day one are entitled to sick pay, paid holidays and parental leave. Uh, Are the Tories doing that? No. Labour right there are committed to not only protecting workers' rights, but expanding them. Anyway, he continues. It pledges to negotiate fair pay agreements with employers and trade unions, setting a floor to wages and working conditions in key sectors. Experienced in other countries suggests that such agreements will not only raise workers' wages, but reduce gender inequalities and help manage the difficult process of technological change and productivity improvement. They would almost certainly reduce in the, reduce the likelihood of strikes. And it is not quite true that Labour is now opposed to nationalism. It has promised to take rail operators back into public ownership when their franchises expire. And we've talked about this before that when it comes to nationalization, rail always charts at the top because you can talk to people about nationalization, but when you're like, what do you want to nationalize? Rail is at the top and the others vary. But overwhelmingly, it is rail by a very significant margin. The others, you're talking maybe about 40%. Water, of course, during the, the sewage crisis we normally have seen from the summer and of course the storms, shot up to above 50%. But you look at the others, they're not really that high. So if Labour wants to focus on nationalisation of the rail, excellent, crack on with it. (coughs) All told, Labour now has a solid economic policy and one which certainly cannot be characterised as new Labour. Its plans for industrial strategy collective bargaining of workers' rights are well into the left of anything done by Tony Blair and Brown. Its climate and energy programme is more radical than Miliband's in 2015. Indeed, accepting nationalisation, it is not too far from the economic prospectus set out in Corbyn's 2017 manifesto. I rest my case. (laughs) (coughs) So, we should not be surprised by this. There is a prevalent myth that Labour only wins from the centre. But this is misreading of the party's post-war history. New Labour was able to win from the centre because the economy was in the middle of a long boom enabling the party to redistribute the fruits of growth to public services and to poverty reduction. But when the economy is doing badly, Labour has always moved to the left, seeking a more active interventions and structural reform. History provides a good guide when this move has led to electoral victory. And it is those epoch-shifting moments when Labour's leaders of Clement Attlee in 1945 Harold Wilson in 1946, were able to present a progressive version of the future. To show what the party's economic programme was not uh, necessarily to meet the profound challenges of its age. Labour's economic programme is not yet as radical as theirs, but it is a serious serious response to the UK's current economic weakness. Can Starmer follow history's example? There is nothing there I can say I would not vote for. I mean, for a start, having a serious economic strategy, an industrial strategy that does not just focus on a couple of key industries, (coughs) but focuses on 
what the vast majority of people are actually employed in in this country works. You've got labor protecting workers' rights, expanding workers' rights, investing in the economy, uh, making sure that people are taxed and treated fairly. There is so much there. There is just so much there. And yet, there are going to be people who tell me that is Tory light. Well, I'm sorry, but you've got to explain why those policies we just went through are Tory light. In fact, no, I'll challenge I'll challenge those people even further. Tell me why those policies are not left wing. Tell me why they are on the right. Now, of course, there may be some people who will accept that challenge. Fair enough. Fine. But like I say, my challenge is still open. I'll reach out to Max. I'll reach out to Political X. Let's have this conversation. I'm sure they can find someone to, for me as well to have a conversation with. Let's get this party rolling, shall we? But as always, guys, um, thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope that's <laughs> illuminated you and given you some food to thought. Because like I say, it's not about, not about the personality. It's about the policies and especially about the outcome that those policies can bring. Those policies that we've seen there would bring a far, far better economic outcome to thousands of people across the country. So, as always, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my uh, Patreon page and a rotation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can buy me coffee. And as always, guys, thank you very much for watching. And of course, we'll see you all next time.